Brother Troy. I must say that the first starting with the children's story, it went very good with the sermon. I know my wife was also planning that song, and the song and the words um, go very well. And there's one thing, and my wife and I kind of joked this week that all I need to do is read the words of the song, and that covers a lot of the sermon. But it's good to have a repetition. So, my brothers and sisters, I would like to encourage you to bow your heads with me as we seek the Lord in prayer. Our dear Lord, once we come to you, we pray that you can speak through me. We pray that by God's grace, each mind can be enlightened. And we pray and thank you for all the blessings you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. Isn't it good to be in church? I don't know what your week has been like, but my, this week and last week has been a challenge. But to come to church to be with family. To have the Sabbath day, to try and put the cares of the world aside, and to be here with brothers and sisters in Christ. How much a blessing that is. So today we're going to look at the subject of remember. And if you're good at knowing your Bible, then we're going to be looking at Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. We're going to be seeing what the Bible says about remember. Starting at verse 8. This is Exodus 20, verse 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. I have a question for you. I just read to you the fourth commandment. What is the fourth commandment about? Shout it out. Sabbath. Someone saying the Sabbath. Someone else say the Sabbath. Anybody else? Holiness. Holiness. Rest. Rest. Sorry, Esther. Keeping the Sabbath. Now I heard someone say this about the Christian religion. The Christians, if you look at other de- denominations, they remember the, the fastings and all things like that. But Christians remember the feast days. I'm not talking about, I'm looking at Christianity in a whole. And you did exactly the same thing then. The fourth commandment is about multiple things. I've got a brother said, uh, I think it was holiness. But the fourth commandment is, part of it is, six days thou shalt labor. Why didn't anybody say it to me? Hmm, that's a big thing, isn't it? And it also talks about the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Let's not go through the Bible and cherry pick the bits we want. Let's look at the whole big picture. I always find it interesting that when people look at the fourth commandment, they look at what thou shalt not do compared to what thou shalt do. Interesting point. But today we're going to be looking at the Sabbath and what such a blessing it is. first section is this Sabbath says this commandment says remember 
the Sabbath day. Okay. So if somebody says, remember, if I say I want to remind you that when you maybe go to the shops to get me whatever, if I say I want to remind you when you pop home to get something for me, if I'm saying remind you, it tells you I've told you before. Okay? So this is not the first instance where the Sabbath was given to mankind. You see, there's a popular misconception out there that the Sabbath was given to the Jews and the Sabbath is the Jewish Sabbath. Now, I'm not sure how good your history is, but when we look at the Bible and the history, the Sabbath was originally given at creation. At the beginning of the world, which we'll find in Genesis 2, verse 1. But let's just find a little bit more information. I want you to shout out the answers. I'll repeat them for the purpose of the recording. So, the Jewish people came from who? What was another name for the Jewish people? Okay. So, I said something about Judah. What was another name for them? Who was the father of the Jewish people? Israelites. Israelites. Father? Abraham. Abraham. And don't quote me on the time scales here, but Abraham was born a long time after the creation of the world. It was born after the flood. So 2,000 years plus after the Sabbath commandment was given to the human race. What also is special about the Sabbath commandment? In the verse 11 of Exodus 20, it's a mark of God's authority. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rest the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So as a day set out as an example to say we need to have a rest, but also to be able to look back at the amazing creation which God or Jesus had done in the first six days of the creation. See how important the Sabbath is. But when you go to Genesis now, Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, 2, and 3. Genesis chapter 2, 1, 2, and 3. I actually want to read this. This was the original place in Genesis where the Sabbath was given to mankind. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. I realize for some of you hearing this, this will be, I know most of this, but it's good to have a refresher. For some of you hearing this, it might be the first time. But it's always good to be going over, not what I say, but what the Bible says. That is such an important principle. So when we come to the Sabbath, many people may say, or ask the question, did Christ change the Sabbath? That's a good question, because many different aspects, did Christ change the Sabbath? Let's turn to Matthew 5, verse 17. Matthew 5, verse 17. And then we'll be looking at verse 18. Because many people think that the act of Christ coming to this earth 
dying on the cross and being raised again on the first day of the week, Sunday, means that Sunday is more important than the seventh day of the week. And who is the founder of the Christian religion? It's kind of interesting, isn't it? It's in the clue, is in the, in the question. Who is the founder of the Christian religion? Christ. So if Christ did not come to change the law, and he's the founder of the religion which we believe in, then it's crazy to think that he would have expected us to do something different. But Matthew 5 verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. And then verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Now that's a very important text, because in the summary it's saying that nothing will change in relationship to the law, or in relationship to the Ten Commandments. But why does it use those words, one jot or one tittle? In the English language, to the modern language, we would use the phrase to make sure you dot the I's and cross the T's. Basically, it means that every unique detail of the law given back in Genesis and in the Ten Commandments still stands today. So if you're confused when we should be worshipping our Saviour, let's follow in our Saviour's example. Some people use Colossians 2 verse 16. Let's turn to that in our Bibles. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16. Some people use this as a text to say that basically this text is saying it's not important about the Sabbath. But let's just read it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of any of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. Okay. That's an interesting point. But let me ask you a question. Who right now is judging you and I? Who will be judging to see who will be saved and who will be lost? Is it me? Am I standing here preaching today? If I look at you and look at things I know about you, and I shall judge you. And then based on my decision will be whether you'll be in heaven or not. Is that what we believe? No. It is not my job to judge you on how you keep the Sabbath. It's not my job to judge you in meat or drink. That's between you and Christ. Like every aspect of our lives. So this is simply saying, let's not judge each other on these subjects. It's not undermining the Ten Commandments which were originally given at the creation of this world. But let's turn to Psalms 50 verse 4. Psalms chapter 50 and verse 4. This is an important text. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Who's that talking about? Is that talking about you and I judging his people? It's talking about God judging his people. So if anyone's confused, 
link those two texts together and we can understand the importance of not judging one another because that is the responsibility of our Saviour. Now let me ask you another question. How should the Sabbath be kept? Lots of people, when you look at the Ten Commandments, they go through a list in their heads. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do something else. That's what the Ten Commandments are about. Yes, it says you can't work, etc., etc. But it talks about a day of rest. You know, if I came to you and said, and if I was your manager or your boss at work, and I said, you know what, next Thursday, I want you to have that day off so you can rest. It's a bonus holiday. Would you sit there and start complaining, oh, that's not very nice? You wouldn't, would you? It's a day of rest, which God has given as a free gift to you and I. It's a day when we can study the Bible, pray, and commune with God. It's an opportunity where we can minister to others to share the truth. Of course we do these things on other days, but it's nice to have a day set aside. It's a little bit like I'm kind of self-employed, and as self-employed, if you have a holiday, you don't get paid. So I try and work every single day I can, but when a bank holiday comes, I've got to take the day off, so I can do other things. But when the Sabbath day comes as a gift from my Creator, it's a day of rejoicing. It's a day when we can take time in God's nature. Who doesn't love time walking the countryside? Who doesn't love time in the fresh air? This is what the Sabbath is about. The Sabbath is about the gift from our Saviour, giving us the time so we can spend it with Him, communing with Him. It is a glorious day where we, by God's grace, can commune with Him. But let's make Sabbath special. Do we take time to open and close the Sabbath in prayer? Maybe song, maybe Bible study, to mark the start and the end of the Sabbath day. And as, the, as we know, as the world was created in Genesis, it talks from the even to the morning, or from sunset to sunset, from a biblical standpoint. If you have children, do we take the time to have special, nice toys for our children? Or do we just let them play with anything? Do we try to make Sabbath a happy time? Maybe a time when we can have that extra nice, healthy food. So we can look forward to it. I look forward to the time when I can come to church and meet you and everybody else which comes. That is the Sabbath, but let me ask you a question. I believe the Sabbath day is the seventh day of the week, which is Saturday. But should I force my beliefs on maybe the person walking down outside this church? Should I send one of you guys to go outside this church, drag that person into the church, and force them to keep the Sabbath day? Should I do that? No. That would be fundamentally against God's principles. In Joshua 24, verse 15... Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, one of my favorite texts. It talks about the power of choice. So I want to read this. Joshua 24, verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose ye this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which we, your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then Matthew 11, verse 28, where well, you're finding that, notice in the previous text, is talking about, choose ye this day whom you'll serve. It's a choice for each one of us. 
and Matthew 11 verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Notice that is an invitation, come. It's not Christ going out forcing. It's Christ saying, come. And this is the fundamental on the plan of salvation. It is a free gift for those which decide to take it, choose it, hold it. It's a choice. So one thing, at this point so far, we, we've learned. Whether you think that Sabbath is on the seventh of the week, Saturday, or whether you think that Sabbath is on a Monday or Wednesday, I hope from reading those texts so far, you will agree with me that it's a free choice whenever we keep it. But don't just stop there. We need to learn when we should keep it. So I would like us to be able to look at our next slide. This slide is from the 1950s. And I want you to tell me what is different from this slide than maybe from a calendar you would see today. This is the original calendar from the order of the days in the week. Can anybody see the difference, what you'd see today? What's the first day from this calendar? The first day is Sunday, the day Christ rose. And what's the last day of this calendar? Saturday is the last day. And I got this calendar, all I did, I went to eBay, I searched for old calendars or calendars from the 1950s, cost like three pounds, sent to me, because it's nice to be able to have the hard evidence of how things are and not what things are being changed to. So if you're wondering the order of the week, take a look. If that's not enough evidence for you, I'd like to look at the next slide. The next slide gives us the order of the week, also in some other languages, which is quite interesting. But this gives us the order of the week from the Britannica Encyclopedia from the 1960s. And I find this so fascinating. If you, if you look at these, I can email them to you. They are printed inside the uh, four Sunday sacredness booklet, say no. But I ask you this question. Why the change? There's no logical reason just to randomly decide to change. Do you know the rail industry still schedules Sunday to Saturday? And other industries probably do the same thing. But why the change to undermine God's fourth commandment? Did you know if you travelled with me all the way to North America, to the United States, the calendar which we saw Sunday to Saturday is still standard. That's what they have, that's the baseline, that's what they use. And this is the interesting thing. When you live in a country or in a continent, you're kind of in a little, your own little zone and you don't think about the reality of the whole world. So a lot's being done to undermine the true Sabbath day. But what I want us to be able to do now though, I want us to be able to look at a few things which are happening in relationship to free choice. We live in a society where some people call themselves Christians, some people call themselves atheists, and I think most atheists are actually agnostics, and obviously other people call themselves Muslims, call themselves Hindu or whatever. I'm not going to list them all. There's 45,000 different religions in the world. But I want to ask you some questions. If you were here on a Sunday and you walked across the supermarket opposite, what would you see difference about Sunday hours compared to any other day of the week? 
they are restricted on a Sunday by law. But I ask you this question. If the consumer wants to shop, the business wants to open, and the person wants to earn more money by working extra hours, why should there be a law restricting that? I also ask the question right now where people are experiencing the problem of the cost of living. I know if I had a job working in a supermarket, I would say, if only I could work maybe three extra hours on a Sunday, and then that could help with the cost of maybe more expensive energy bills or fuel. Why is Sunday trading hours being restricted? Leave that question with you. Now I want to move on to another subject. This subject can come under the title of Climate Sabbaths, Green Sabbaths, Car-Free Sundays. I don't know if you saw in the Guardian newspaper a few months ago when petrol prices started shooting up, there was this suggestion in relationship to saving fuel. And they were suggesting one idea was to have car-free Sundays. In different cities around the world, they had the idea of, let's reduce pollution and let's have a car-free Sunday. But again, why would you choose to do it on a Sunday, which is stereotypically one of the days of the week where there's less people driving to work, there's less people on the road. Why would you do it on a Sunday when there's, that's the less of an issue? Why would you do it on a Monday or a Tuesday? You can just follow the logic here. I'm not, I'm not saying we should have any car-free Sundays. I do think we need to respect the environment and look after God's creation. That's two different things. I'm just asking the question, why on a Sunday? It's a little bit like an a obese person, someone who is overweight. They eat lots of chips and f fried food. They eat cakes. And they also eat salad. And they make the decision, they want to lose weight. So they, so they decide to give up the salad. That is how ridiculous it is to have a car-free Sunday when that's one of the days of the week where there's less people driving around anyway. If they really care about what is being talked about, they would say, we need to do this on a Wednesday because there's so many people driving around. Just follow their logic. I'm not advocating any car-free day. I'm just trying to highlight why on a Sunday. Something else which has been talked about in the past is, let's have a family day. A family day sounds great, doesn't it? A day for your family. But don't we already spend the most time on a Sunday with our family? For the majority, we're thinking here. Don't we always have Mother's Day and Father's Day on a, what day is it normally? Sunday. So why is the need to try to encourage people to keep a special day of the week for the family? For you, it may work best on a Tuesday. For you, it may work best on a Saturday. For you, it may work best on a Monday. Well, are we beginning to see an underlying current which is happening in our society to try to make Sunday special? Are you beginning to see that? You could probably look at numerous other Examples. Have you ever heard of a, a blue law? Some people may have heard of blue laws, some may not. What is a blue law? A blue law, in essence, is a law which is, has been written, developed, it's law, but not enforced. It's either lapsed or it's been written so they can enforce it when they want to. These blue laws are in different sections of the United States in different sections in uh, Europe. And basically, they, they, they restrict the operations of what we can do on a Sunday to make it illegal. Did you realize that in countries in Europe, such as Germany and other countries, 
our truck drivers in this church could not drive a HGV on the road in those days. But why on a Sunday? I'll leave those questions with you because in a few moments we're going to study history and when we study history we can then be able to see has this type of thing happened in the past? That's an important question. Has these things happened in the past? If you travel with me, before we travelled from here to the United States, this time we're going to travel from here to Rome. And we're not just going to travel by t distance, we're going to travel by time. This time we're going to travel back to AD 321. 321. Who was reigning then? Someone said it, it's Constantine the Great. And if we can learn from the history, we can see what's going to happen for the future. But Constantine had a problem. Part of his empire was pagan. Part of his empire had come from the Christians or the Jewish church. And both of these different religions wanted to keep their own holy day. The pagans wanted to keep Sunday special, the day of the sun. The Christians and the Jews wanted to keep Saturday holy from the creation of the world and also in the Ten Commandments. So what could Constantine do to unite his empire? Is to unite his empire on a day which could ensure that everybody wanted to have a special day, the same day of the week. I want to read a little section. It's um, in the little booklet, page 16 and 17. Obviously, this is where it's quoting. But I want to read, this is from the, the law which was passed back then. It says, all judges and city people and the craftsmen shall rest upon the venerable day of the sun. Country people, however, may freely attend to the cultivation of the fields, because it frequently happens that no other days are better adapted for planting the grain in the furrows or the vines in trenches. So the advantage given by heavenly providence may not for the occasion of a short time perish. But what's it saying here? It's a law setting out in stone about the people must keep the venerable day of the sun. Now I have a question for you. Do you think Constantine, he woke up one morning and thought, I'm going to enact this law? Or do you think he planned, prepared, deviated, coerced, and then got the law in? I want to read a little section by Ellen White. Little by little, at first, in stealth and in silence, and then more openly as it increased in strength and gained control of the minds of men. The mystery of iniquity carried forward its deceptive and blasphemous work. Almost imperceptibly, the customs of heathenism found their way into the Christian church. The spirit of compromise and conformity was restrained for a time by the fierce persecutions with which the church endured under paganism. But as persecution ceased and Christianity entered the courts and palaces of kings, she laid aside the humble simplicity of Christ and his apostles for the pomp and pride of pagan priests and rulers. And in place of the requirements of God, she substituted human theories and traditions. The nominal converse, conversion of Constantine in the early part of the 4th century caused great rejoicing 
and the world arrayed in robes of righteousness walked into the church. Now the work of corruption rapidly progressed. Paganism, while appearing to be vanquished, became the conqueror. Her spirit controlled the church. Her doctrine, ceremonies, and superstitions were incorporated into the faith and worship of the professed followers of Christ. And that was taken from the story of redemption, page 326, by Ellen White. But notice there how paganism came in to the church. The pagans which worshipped the renewal day of the sun won the argument in great. This is why Sunday worship is so important today because of what Constantine did back then in AD 321. But the interesting thing with Constantine, as I asked the question earlier, he didn't just do this, I wake up in the morning, I know. I'm going to implement a new law. He started slowly. He started by having the Sunday as a special day, set aside, maybe for feasts and things like that. And also, thanks to the pharisaical laws, which were laws introduced by man, people saw the true Sabbath as a day of drudgery. Did you know back then that the Israelites or the Jewish nation, they'd implemented laws like you can only carry something so far, you can't start a fire, you can't do something else, and so on. And made the Sabbath day, instead of a day of delight, where we can worship God and have a rest day, they made it a day of drudgery. Which is sad because probably many people here have ancient relatives from the Jewish nation. But my brothers and sisters, my friends, what is important today is, is that we study the truth as it is in the Bible. There's one thing here, you may find it a surprise for me to say this, but I like a religion which is honest. Okay. The Catholic Church. There's many different aspects of what they teach. If we sat down in a Bible study together, I would probably say is like, come on my brother, let's get back to the Bible. Let's get back to the truth in God's Word. But this is from the Catholic Catechism, if I can say it correctly. But this is what it says. The Catechism of the Catholic Church states that, and this is what it says, it is the mystery of Holy Saturday when Christ lying in the tomb reveals God's great Sabbath. Rest after the fulfillment of man's salvation, which bring peace to the whole universe. I'm not sure which particular Catholic wrote that, but it is a very inspiring text. It's referenced in my little booklet, but that was written, and it came originally from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 624-625, archived December 25th, 2010, at the Wayback Machine. You see, my brothers and sisters, at least that one religion says, look, the true Sabbath day is this day from Christ's example. But as I said earlier, this is your right to choose. Your right to choose is to go back and study the Bible. And then it's your decision. Do you want to follow Christ's example and the biblical example or you just want to do your own thing. And whilst it would be sad for you to go away and say, you know what, I want to keep the vulnerable day of the sun, which the pagans introduced into Christianity. I want to do that. That's your right to do that. 
Yes, it will affect your salvation if you know what is right and wrong. But God gives us the free choice to follow him or not. But I strongly believe this principle. Don't take my word for it. Don't take a pastor's word for it, an elder's word for it, your mum, your dad, whoever. This is something which yourself needs to be convicted on. In 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, this is one of the key texts which will dictate our beliefs. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That text says, it does not say, listen solely to what your pastor or elder says, or priest or holy man or whoever it might be. It says, written to you, study to show thyself approved. And the latter section, rightly dividing the word of truth. And also now, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. And what you find that, I hear sometimes people say things like this. You go and show them from the Bible. You give them the facts, the evidence. And then they say to you, well, I believe this. With due loving respect, I don't care what you believe. I don't care what anybody believes. I care what Christ believed and what was in the Bible, God's holy word. But in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21, it reads, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. How true it is. Prove it, prove it, prove it. From the only source of truth, the Bible. Our root and foundation of our beliefs. Then Isaiah 8 verse 20. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20. Another favourite text here. Isaiah 8 verse 20 reads, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. So I have a question. You might have a friend. You might have somebody you know which is genuinely, honestly keeping Sunday as the Sabbath day. Because there's lots of people which are good Christians which are confused on this. And the Bible does say, at the time of the ignorance, God winked at. But how should you deal with these friends, these family, maybe the man on the street or the woman on the street? How do you deal with them? Do you go up there and be judgmental and say, look, 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 you've got the wrong day of the week? Or do you follow the biblical principle of going to them, quietly talking to them and trying to win their soul? Because it's not a decision about purely who is right and wrong. It's not just an academic decision. It is a decision because you don't want to be right. That's not what the argument's about, the discussion. What the discussion is about is you want your brother, your sister, your family member to be in the kingdom of heaven to spend eternity there. My brother, sisters, Words, you may have heard these words spoken, you said, that is the truth. But we need to implement the truth in love and kindness. In closing, I would like to turn to the last text of Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11. Revelation 3 verse 11. This is such an amazing promise. If you go through times of trials, troubles, tribulations... This text is for you, because Christ is coming soon. It says these words in Revelation 3 verse 11. Behold, I come quickly.
quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man may take thy crown. My brothers and sisters, my friends, my family, as time progresses, the decision will come, do we stand true to God? In many aspects, not just the Sabbath, but many aspects. But we need to hold fast the truths which we have and don't allow any man to take our crown. My brothers and sisters, let's pray for one another, help one another, encourage one another and love one another so we can all be in the kingdom of heaven. May God richly bless each one of you today.
change times and laws, the laws that God's finger engraved on the tables of stone. Those who oppose it, it tramples and kills that city that sits on seven hills. That market causes small and great to receive on forehead or hand, in thought or